Hey guys, Chris from Adaptuation here, and in this video, I'm going to show you the solution for question 1 from the Jan 2023 PUA paper 2. If you want to see the solutions to the other questions on this paper, I'm going to put a card up there and a link in the description below. So be sure to check those out as well. And with that said, let's get into the question. Okay, so we begin as usual by reading the question. So it says Dimpo is the sole trader who owns Dimpo's meat shop. He provided the following information for the financial year ending 31st December 2022. Okay, so I'm going to show you the whole table. We have five items, sorry, six items here, all right? Now they each deal with a specific adjustment. And rather than read through all six and then go back and start from the beginning, I'm going to deal with them one at a time and move sequentially. Now, item one says the original cost of $140,000 for the delivery van is depreciated at 20% per annum using the reducing diminishing balance method. Okay, so what I'm going to do, let me just scroll down very quickly so you can see the T account that is connected to this item here. Right, so you're seeing provision for depreciation delivery van, you have your debit side, you have your credit side, and they have the opening balance brought down as of 1 Jan 2022. So that balance there, listen to it, that balance currently existing in the account is all of the depreciation previously charged on this delivery van. So it's the accumulated depreciation, right? So the balance brought on is 28,000. It's on the credit side because the provision for depreciation is a contra asset. Remember, its function is to reduce the value of an asset in the balance sheet. And if assets have debit balances and the provision, a contra account is supposed to reduce that balance, reduce the debit balance, the provision itself, the contra asset, must have the opposite type of balance, a credit balance. Okay, so I'm going to go back up to the information now. There we go. And I'm going to pull up my T account. So let me enter the opening balance as given in the question. Now, what they want us to do here is to record the current year's depreciation expense. Now, they said they're using the reducing balance method. Now, how do we calculate the depreciation charge for the current year, the current year's depreciation expense? under the reducing balance method? Well, we have to multiply the depreciation rate by the net book value of the asset. What is this net book value thing, Chris? Well, the net book value is the difference between the cost of the asset, the 140,000 they're showing here, and the existing depreciation, which is the 28,000. So we're gonna take 140 and subtract 28. That's gonna give us 112. When you multiply that by 20%, you're going to get 22,400. Now, on what side of the account do we put that item? Well, it's going to go on the credit side. Because remember, what did we just calculate? The 22,400? That's the current year's depreciation expenditure. Well, now you might say, but Chris, don't expenses have debits when we record them? So yes, in the, now, you see the thing is, according to what method of depreciation you use, sorry, what bookkeeping method you use to record depreciation, you may or may not have a depreciation expense account, right? When I was doing um, CSEC, well, it wasn't called CSEC back then. Yes, it was quite some time ago. <laughs> um, right, we were taught, and I'm pretty sure most of you all have been taught as well, that we debit the income statement and credit the, the provision account, which is what I'm gonna do here, right? So you're gonna see it says, Debit, sorry, um, it says income statement, that's on the credit side, right? So we credit because remember, we're increasing the provision. We're increasing the contra asset, right? And remember, the contra assets function is to reduce the assets balance in the balance sheet. Assets have debit balances. To reduce those, we have to have a credit balance, right? So we're increasing the provision by 22,400. Right? The other half of the entry will be in the income statement. Now again, that's more the British style of accounting that I am accustomed to and I'm pretty sure most of you and your teachers are accustomed to that. When I went to UE, however, we learned that, hey, you know, there's actually a depreciation expense account which is used for double entry. And the funny part is if you go on to do CAPE accounting, you're expected to know that. So I'm not sure when they expect you to learn that stuff, if it's between the, the, the summer vacation, when you finish CSEC and before you start CAPE, which obviously we know you're not doing that, um, so anyhow, that's a whole different story for next time. But long story short, we're going to put the 224 on this side. Now, what do we have to do? Well, just balance off the account. The total on the credit side is 50,004. There are no entries on the debit side. So all we have to do is to balance carry down 50,400, put that as the total and bring the balance down here. 
right? Now you can head up to an A23, one John, but I'm leaving it there for now, right? Um, okay, cool. So that's the first item. Let's take a look at the second item, shall we? Right, so item two says the insurance expense for the financial year amounted to 15,700. So insurance account, and there's a debit item that says bank 15,000. Now that is the payment for insurance for, I'm assuming, the year. Right, the total they've paid for insurance, and I guess they paid all at the end of the year. Um, no, yeah, that, that's perfectly fine. You don't necessarily have a monthly insurance expense. So I'm going to pull up my insurance expense account here. I'm going to put the debit entry, and I'm going to scroll back up here to the item itself. Right. So the ex the, the expense it says was fifteen thousand seven. Okay, but the thing is, that's what it says. It says the expense for the year was fifteen seven, but here we're seeing we've only paid fifteen thousand. So if we were supposed to pay 15,007, but we only paid 15, what does that mean? Well, it means we didn't pay enough. There's 700 that we still have left to pay. And what do we call that? What do we call that piece of an expense that is left unpaid or owing at the end of a financial period? That's an accrued expense, right? Okay, good. Now, accrued expenses are liabilities. Liabilities are represented or shown as having credit balances. So that 700 is going to come down here on the credit side of the insurance account before being brought down on the credit side because again it's an accrued expense which is represented by a credit balance because it's a liability and liabilities are credit balances before being brought down on the credit side it has to first be carried on from the debit side right so it's going to be carried down from here brought down from here but of course, we have to balance off first, right? So the total on that side will be 15.7 as for the total on this side. But what is the detail here? So remember, it said that the insurance expense was 15.7, right? Just like the depreciation expense in the previous question had income statement as the details, that is exactly what we have to put here. Uh, hold on. Ah, there you go. <laughs> right. Um, income statement 15,007, right? The amount of the expense, how much ever was incurred, regardless of how much, if any, was actually paid, that is the amount that goes in the income statement. So the question said 15,007, that's the income statement figure, right? Now, of course, the other way I could have done, so let me just take out some of these things here, right? Right, so the other way we could have done it is that we could have said, okay, look, the insurance expense for the financial year amounted to 15,007, right? That's the income statement figure. The income statement figure in the expense accounts are put on the credit side because in the income statement, they are recorded as debits. Now, if you want to see a video, a tutorial on how to do expense accounts like this, uh, expense and revenue accounts, I'm going to put a card up there and a link in the description below. So you can check that out and then come back here if you still have a little trouble, right? Anyhow, so we paid 15000 but we were supposed to pay or we incurred 15700 which means we need a 50, uh, sorry, we need a 700 on this side to make the account balance. And that 700 is the amount left unpaid in respect of insurance at the end of the period, which means we're going to be bringing it down on the credit side, which implies a liability, which it in fact is. It's an accrued expense, all right? Okay, let me just um, scroll down a little bit. Give me one sec. All right, so the next item we have to take a look at is the rent receivable owing by a tenant amount of the 1200. Okay, so we have a credit entry in the rent receivable account that says one Jan. And it says bank. So this is the amount of money we got, right? The other half of this entry would be on the debit side of bank, and it would say in the details rent receivable, thirteen thousand two. The uh, oh, oh yeah, the rent receivable owing by a tenant was twelve hundred. Now first of all, let's put in the amount we actually received thirteen thousand two. Now, if they tell us the receivable owing, it means that the person did not pay us the full amount, the total amount they were supposed to pay. So how do we cater for that? How do we deal with that here? Well, we received 13,002. If they shortchanged us 1,200, that means that that's a receivable, which is an asset. And assets have debit balances when brought down. So we could put 1,200 brought down on the debit side here. And before it could be brought down on the debit side, it has to first be carried down on the credit side. So you can put it on this side. Now the total here would say 14,400, which of course should be matched on the debit side. But what would the detail be? If, if you said the income statement figure, you're absolutely correct. It would be the revenue earned, the rent earned, right? Now, why would it go on the debit side? Isn't revenue a credit item? Yes, it is. 
That's why we put the receipts here. And when you transfer the amount earned to the income statement, it would go to the credit of the income statement. And every credit needs a corresponding debit. So you'll see the debit here, 14,004, which is the total amount we would have earned for the entire year. Income statement, the other account affected by the transaction and the date, right? Okay, so that's the rent receivable. Let's take a scroll on to the next item. So item five, so we'll come back to item four. Item five, Dimpo withdrew $5,000 to pay for an airline ticket for his son. Okay, so that's drawings. So what we're gonna see here is we are going to see the drawings figure, right? It says cash, 5,000, that's on the debit side because drawings is a reduction in capital. A double entry to capital safe. To decrease capital, you have to debit capital. So that's why you have a debit item here. Right, and that's the only item inside of here. So of course, the balance of the account, all we do is put balance carried down on the credit side like that and bring the balance down here, right? Now, we have something else to do with this after. Let me come back to it. So we're actually gonna have to do like four, five, and six together. Give me one sec. Okay, so like I said, we have a few things to put together for the capital account. The imposed capital account balance brought down 35,008. So let me put in the 35,008 here on the credit side and capital as credit balances. So we have a couple of things, right? So one is no entry had been made in the accounting records for an additional investment of 25,000 introduced into the business on the 29th of December, 2022. So the put in additional capital, if you're, which means the capital balance is increasing. To record an increase in capital, you have to credit the capital account. So we're going to go on the credit side and put 25,000, right? Then the drawings figure that we just did, the 5,000, will have to be put on the opposite side because, again, drawings reduces capital. It represents amounts taken out by the owner, which will reduce capital. And then the final item, the draft net loss for the financial year after all adjustments were made, was made, right, was 14,000. Now, a lot of you all don't end up being shown this particular part of it. Remember, when someone starts a business, they do so to make a profit. Profit means you're making more money than you'd had before. So when the owner invests money, right, that goes on the credit side here. That money is used to buy assets, which is used to create goods or services, which are then provided to customers, so revenue is earned. Out of that revenue, you pay expenses, anything left to is the profit, and guess who gets the profit? The owner, right? So if the owner makes a profit, that would actually increase the owner's uh, resources, personal resources. So that would go on the credit side if it was a profit. If it's a loss, it goes on the debit side because it literally represents the owner losing money. The owner didn't make enough revenue from providing goods or services, which means that the money that you had invested would have been, I mean, you, you did spend it to, what you call it, to buy your assets and maybe maybe to, even to pay for expenses, maybe you did. But it means that you didn't get back your money. And if you didn't get back your money, you technically you lost it, right? And that loss would decrease capital and would be shown on the debit side, right? Now, of course, we have to balance off the account to see how much capital is left. So you started off with 35,800, you put in 25 more, that's about 60,800. Let's see that. Yeah, that's correct. Now that has to be matched on this side as well, but this side only has 19,000. 5 and 14 is 19. So it means you need 41,800. And that balance is brought down on the credit side, right? Okay, so that's it for the first part of the question. Uh, let's take a look at the other parts. Okay, so it says Dimpo divides its ledger into three sections general ledger, sales ledger, and purchases ledger. State two advantages of dividing the ledger into these three sections. Okay, so I'm just going to put it up, right? So two advantages of dividing the ledger into three sections are keeping like accounts together or not mixing up different types of accounts. So in your sales ledger, you have all of your debtors or all of your receivables together, right? In your purchases ledger, you have all of your creditors or accounts payable. And in a general ledger, you have all of the other accounts. Now, technically speaking, shouldn't you then subdivide the general ledger into assets, liabilities, maybe expenses, revenues, and then other, because then you'd have all your assets together, all of your liabilities together, etc., etc. right? But again, that's just my stupid idea. Now, the other advantage I have is ease of reference. It makes it easy to find certain accounts quickly, right? But to me, that's just another offshoot of keeping like accounts together, right? Um, if anybody has any textbooks and or you have any notes and you want to put other advantages of dividing the legend to these sections, by all means, 
please put them in the comment section below so we could share some knowledge and grow together. Now the last part to this, this part of the question says name the ledger in which Dimpo's capital account would appear. Well, that's easy. Dimpo's capital account would appear in the general ledger. Okay, so that's it for one part A. Let's check out one part B. Okay, so state why Dimpo is applying the following accounting principles by maintaining a provision for depreciation on non-current assets. Now the first one they have is prudence. And the second one I have is the accruals or matching principle. I'm going to start with that one because that's the one I know that we obey when we provide for depreciation. So I'm going to pull it up here. It says depreciation facilitates adherence to the matching principle by allowing a charge, a charge for the use of the assets, right, to be matched against the benefits derived from using the asset, right? Now the charge for the use of the assets is the fall in value of the asset due to use. Now, the matching principle itself says that to calculate profit, you have to match two things. Revenue earned in a period and the expenses incurred in the creation of that same revenue. Now, when you use your non-current assets, machinery, equipment, computers, etc., etc., when you use those things, they fall in value through depreciation. And when you use those non-current assets, you help generate revenue. So the assets provide benefits. The matching principle says you have to match those benefits with the cost that help create the benefits. The cost of using the assets is depreciation. So you have to match the revenue generated by using the assets with a charge for using the assets, which is the depreciation. Okay? Now, the first one said prudence. Now, I don't know prudence to be used in the context of depreciation. I know prudence to be used with provision for bad debts. Um, the lower of cost or net realizable value for stock and maybe a few other things, right? But I've never heard it used in the context of depreciation. That does not mean that it is not used. It just means I never heard of it. Now, the best I could do is this. It says depreciation decreases the value of non-current assets in the balance sheet, which thereby facilitates the do not overstate the value of assets aspect of the prudence concept. Now, I don't really like the articulation that I put there and also... This is how I think a lot of teachers at the CSEC level teach the prudence concept. Do not overstate, so sorry, understate the value of your assets and overstate your liabilities. Which I, now I read somewhere, and the kind of stupid part is I don't remember where I read it, that that's not actually what prudence says at all. It is a paraphrasing of the prudence concept. Now, I have to find where I read that and go back and get the actual words for you. I do remember that prudence is the exercise of caution in the face of uncertainty. And that is why we create a provision for bad debts or an allowance for doubtful debts, right? So if anybody knows the reason um, behind why the prudence concept is represented or followed when you provide for depreciation, please feel free to leave it in the comment section below and we can discuss it a bit more. Other than that, I don't think prudence is followed when you're using depreciation. But again, I could be wrong. I don't know everything and I'm sure I have a lot to learn. Anyhow, let's check out the last part of this question. Okay, so it says the following document is a credit note that was issued by Dimpo's meat shop. Examine the entire document carefully and then fill in the boxes with the missing figures to complete the credit note. Credit note, Dimpo's meat shop, 32 Notre Street, Moco, Seaside Restaurant and Bar, Terrell Street, Morco. Okay. Uh, CHS, December 2020. So, quantity 2, mixed chicken parts, unit price 120, among 240. Right. So, 2 multiplied by 120 is 240, less some unknown percent of trade discount, unknown dollar amount. But the total is $216. The discount would be subtracted from the 240. So, something subtracted from 240 is $216. To find that something, you can simply subtract the 216 from the 240. That will give you $24. Now, to find that as a percentage, you simply put it over the 240. 24 over 240 is 10%. So I'm going to pull up my filled in credit note. So you see less 10% trade discount, giving you $24. You don't have to have the brackets. You can put a minus sign. You don't have to put anything like that. We know discount is subtracted. It even has the word less, right? But I like mine as a visual cue, okay? And there's just one very small part left to this question. Let's take a quick look at it. Okay, so it says, suggest one reason for the issue of the credit note. Now, the only reason to issue a credit note is for a return. In words, not so? So maybe they're really asking you, well, suggest, suggest one reason for the return in words. 
reasons. Okay? All right. So one reason for the issue of a criminal, well, a return in one. That's the basic reason, right? The overarching one. Then what are the reasons for returning in? We have defective goods. Maybe the chicken parts were spoiled. Who knows, right? Incorrect goods. Maybe they didn't want chicken parts. Maybe they wanted beef or pork or I don't know. And overcharge. Maybe we charge them too much, right? And to curry favor. Now that have nothing to do with meat being curried. And whether it's curry chicken or chicken curry, don't start. Do not start. It is curry chicken. Don't start. I don't want to hear it. I like putting comments. Anyhow, um, <laughs> that simply means that maybe you want to show that customer that you know you kind of have their back in certain instances. Maybe they had a hard time paying and you wanted to give them a, a break because they were good customers. Or maybe you're trying to get them to be repeat customers to so say, hey, what? we'll knock off a little bit this time for you. Don't worry about it, right? And therefore, they might be encouraged to come back and uh, buy stuff from you, right? If you know any more reasons why a credit note could be issued, please feel free to put them in the comments below and we can learn them good together. Anyhow, guys, that's about it for this question. All right, guys, so there you have it. That's the solution for question one from the Jan 2023 POA paper two. If you have any further questions about any particular part of it, please feel free to put them in the comment section below and I'll get back to you when I have a chance. If you want to check out any more videos, I'm going to put some cards up here. Don't forget to subscribe and please be sure to check out my website where you'll find some interesting POA handouts for free. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time. Bye.